um, hear about some of the empirical work that's been done on the psychosocial implications. And so first up is Christopher Wade. Here he is. Great. Um, and uh, then we will have lunch. So you've got a big, uh, you know, incentive to keep it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Well, hi, everyone. <laughs> I'm really happy to be here. Um, I'm excited about this topic, something I've been able to work out, work on throughout my career. Um, and I'd also like to say that I'm really, oh, so, I'd also like to say that I'm just honored to be here uh, as part of this project, uh, largely because uh, the Hastings Center actually put together two books uh, that Eric took the lead on around disability and genetic testing and uh, enhancement in genetic testing. And those two books were actually some of the motivators for me actually entering this career. So in some ways, I feel like this is sort of a full circle thing where I get to like contribute back. So um, it, is, it, is, it is an honor and I'm delighted to be in this role. So I will say that I became somewhat less delighted when I found out what my topic was <laughs> going to be. <laughs> So imagine my consternation when I found out that my topic to try and address to all of you was to summarize the current status of research on the psychosocial impact of genetic and genomic information. <laughs> so uh, that was a little worrying. Um, and uh, for those of you who were on that phone call, you probably caught my, my concern. Um, the concern relates to uh, the, the scope of the literature that is out there. Um, so when you look at publications that are looking at genetic testing, uh, if you look at that, that turns out to be around 83,000 papers at this point. Um, and if you look at, uh, I did a search looking at uh, publications over a year looking at psychosocial issues in genetic testing, and I did a Boolean search, so it's a string, but it's pretty specific to psychosocial issues. We have about 4,000 papers. I will say, just looking at these charts, it's kind of interesting because there's some conversation around psychosocial issues, possibly people thinking, well, maybe we should move away from that as a topic. And it doesn't seem like that's what's happening. Uh, it seems like, you know, they're sort of going up along with uh, research around, around genetic testing. Point being here that uh, there's a lot of literature on the psychosocial issues around genetic testing, and um, I felt that there might be more realistic ways of trying to address this um, rather than looking at all 4,000 papers. So um, my realistic aim that I have negotiated with Eric uh, has been to try and summarize what finding systematic reviews that have looked at psychosocial impacts of genetic testing have to say about this, this question. So um, what are, I want to start out, usually we talk about benefits and limitations at the end, but I want to actually start out with this at the beginning because I think it will sort of frame how you view what I tell you. Um, there's some benefits to looking at these systematic reviews. Uh, they do use a systematic approach that you can replicate. So there's a little bit of, uh, and there's usually clarity about the methods that they took in terms of looking at this information. Um, they, they have looked at a wide range of different literature types. I'll talk a little bit about how systematic reviews actually do tend to over-represent over and overemphasize certain types of literature over the other types of literature, primarily quantitative literature over qualitative literature. Um, um, but one of the things that I, I appreciate from this is in these systematic reviews, we'll actually be able to see insight provided by each of these, these, these authors into what they view this overall scope of literature to be saying. So these reviews have variable different aims. They're actually quite diverse, and I'll, I'll talk about that later. But um, the, the, uh, there's a limitation in that they have these different approaches. There, there is some consistency between them, but they, they do re represent a fairly diverse set of different types of projects. Um, the other thing I want to say is that these systematic reviews I'll be talking about do have overlap in source material, right? So they're not necessarily independent systematic reviews. So there are, uh, I found, uh, what, around 10 different reviews looking at uh, hereditary cancers. A lot of the papers that they, these systematic reviews cite are actually the same paper. So um, in some senses, there's overlap in terms of what they're, what they're looking at. That, that said, I would say that there probably is value to looking at how these systematic reviews describe them because we're looking at how different authors interpret and synthesize that information. So take that for, for what you will. 
they use variable search strategies and then also have um, there's inconsistencies in terms of coverage of different types of health conditions and different types of test types. I also want to add a, a personal caveat here that goes back to the 4,000 papers. Um, and that is my personal capacity to actually answer your questions about this literature. <laughs> um, <laughs> I didn't write these systematic reviews. Uh, so I'll tell you kind of what I saw. And I'm going to do my best to give you my interpretation of what I saw overall. Um, uh, but I didn't write those systematic reviews, and I certainly didn't write all the papers that uh, those systematic reviews are referring to. So um, I'm going to do my best here, and uh, I, we have a lot of experts in the audience, so I'm curious what people, many of you who, who actually wrote these papers, have to say about <laughs> this, these interpretations. And I'm very comfortable with the idea that people will have different interpretations of this. Uh, so that's uh, part of why this, this whole project is uh, fairly interesting. So I, I want to start with some of the methods I used to look at this question. Um, so what I tried to do was a systematic review of systematic reviews, which is kind of an interesting thing to do. But um, uh, I looked at uh, five different uh, databases. These databases were selected based upon uh, being used in other systematic reviews of uh, psychosocial issues related to genetic testing. And um, um, uh, let's see. Uh, when I looked at those databases, I had a range. I used a strategy that used essentially five different categories. Uh, these were essentially end searches, meaning that uh, one term from each of these bins, five bins, had to be included in the title and abstract or in the in the in the the, the, the citation in the database. Uh, one is that it had to have the return of a review. It also had to be a system, have the term systematic or systematic review, systematically reviewing. It had to be a meta-analysis or a meta-synthesis. Then I uh, asked a range of questions around uh, the information source, things like did it address genetic testing or diagnostic testing or some other term related to that. Uh, it had to include some sort of psychosocial variable. Um, now, I have a list of different ones that I've selected for a range of reasons, but um, you know, this tried to encompass a lot of the different types of psychosocial variables that we'll be thinking about. And then it had to have some element of connection to health-related uh, testing. All right, so uh, from this, I found uh, 1,913 different uh, publications. Um, I then uh, removed duplicates, removed about 766 of those uh, using manual and computer-based uh, removal systems. Uh, I then, um, uh, for the remaining 1,142, I then uh, did a review of the titles and abstracts to uh, determine whether they had appropriate topic, design, uh, publication type for inclusion, uh, which brought me to uh, 86 articles where I actually looked at the, uh, the publications themselves. Um, and then uh, in, in looking at those publications, I tried to select them uh, uh, looking at a range of different criteria, those criteria being they had to be a systematic review, meta-analysis, or meta-synthesis, uh, published in an English language peer-reviewed journal, uh, I only looked at the past uh, 20 years, since 1998, and it had to have a psychosocial uh, factor that it was addressed in that paper. Um, one, it had to be looking at that psychosocial variable in response to genetic testing of some sort, rather than looking at that psychosocial variable in response to, say, a health condition, so a genetic condition of various sorts. Um, that becomes a little hard to distinguish, but, uh, but that's, that was what I was trying to do in, in my assessment there. Um, I had to look at responses to re, uh, some sort of response of individuals who were tested. I'll talk later. Um, I also am considering also including prenatal testing uh, and newborn screening, where you actually don't like look at the response of the person who was actually tested, typically. Um, but um, for now, what I'm looking at uh, does include that criteria. Um, um, it also had to be assessed independently. That psychosocial variable had to be assessed independently of other variables. Right, so uh, some of these uh, study uh, systematic reviews sort of glommed everything together, and it was hard to really distinguish what they were actually saying by psychosocial variables. So there had to be a distinction there. And then, uh, in some cases, especially large systematic reviews that looked at a lot of different vari uh, variables, sometimes they only have one or two uh, reviews, and I, I require that they at least have three pub uh, publications that were relevant to the questions I'm interested in. So based upon that. 
Uh, I identified 33 publications that uh, were of interest in this systematic review. So, um, so what am I talking about when I talk about psych psychosocial concerns? So it's actually a range of different things that we considered here, but we've already, in, I, I haven't really done the background here, and that's because essentially the previous talks were the background for this, but um, you know, we're thinking about things like worry, distress, but also social factors like a survivor's guilt or altered family relationships, uh, other types of things like genetic determinism or stigma. Uh, so that might be s examples of psychosocial concerns. You could also consider things like so psychosocial benefits. So you might imagine that there might be de decreases in these different psychosocial variables, things like re relief coping mechanisms that might be enacted or a a positive effects on uh, different social relationships. So uh, when I did this review, uh, remember I looked at that 86 and I removed a whole bunch of different uh, systematic reviews. Um, I wanted to say that there were a, a fair number of reviews that are interesting and relevant, uh, interesting but not relevant based on the criteria I looked at. So I want to say just a couple words ar around those so you know what I'm not looking at in this, uh, but what we should also be thinking about when we address this question, okay? So one is prenatal testing and newborn screening. I actually think when I write the paper, I'm going to include those. Um, uh, there's also looking, uh, questions around health benefit and cost effectiveness of testing. So um, again, if you're gonna think about whether or not we should go forward with testing and we're thinking about these psychosocial variables, we do want to also consider what the health benefits of those tests are. And there's a lot of research that tries to say, okay, are there health benefits to undergoing testing? And the answers for that is sometimes yes and sometimes no, depending on the test, right? Um, there's also a lot of systematic reviews that looked at behavioral responses to testing. I did not actually include those. Um, now, arguably, some people actually include behavioral behaviors as uh, an indication of psychosocial variables because uh, psychosocial variables inspire people to engage in behaviors and therefore behaviors are perhaps in indicators of psychosocial traits. Um, uh, I didn't include those for because of conversations around what they wanted me to focus on. Uh, but um, what I will say generally about this literature is that there is uh, indications that for uh, serious risks uh, in terms of uh, genetic testing that people do engage in protective behaviors of various sorts. Uh, there's also some indications that for uh, lower level lists, uh, risk susceptibilities, that there are sometimes changes, for example, you know, looking, searching for multivitamins, even in cases when you, know, you don't have preventive measures. Or there are some, some indications, that this is actually kind of controversial, there's recent, uh, some recent meta-analyses su suggesting that there is um, some uh, changes in response to even these sort of lower susceptibilities. Um, there's a lot of studies looking at genetic counseling and communication interventions, uh, and this is really interesting because ultimately we want to, want to know what you can do about this, and this is looking at the interventions that we can engage in to decrease these psychosocial risks that we're interested in. Uh, generally speaking, we find that genetic counseling is actually quite helpful, and uh, uh, that uh, there are a range of different strategies that we need to be thinking about in terms of going forward that we can engage to do this. I didn't look at things like knowledge and attitudes towards genetic testing. Um, I didn't look at responses to genetic disorders, uh, factors influencing uptake, and um, the one thing that I think is important and that I actually will talk about a little bit is uh, a major consideration here is what the psychosocial impact would be on people who decline testing, okay? So I looked at people who were tested, um, but the question here is, what happens if you actually decide not to undergo testing? And what is the psychosocial impact of that by comparison? So I just wanna address that very quickly uh, before I go into my findings. Um, there was one systematic review that I found which did look at this. And uh, what they found overall was that uh, there was uh, a range of quality um, but uh, most of the studies that they found uh, in the 23 papers that they looked at, they seemed, seemed to have adequate quality. They didn't feel comfortable making a recommendation, a strong recommendation based on what they saw. Um, but they did suggest that there is actually importance to monitoring distress around people who decide not to get testing. People who decline generally may actually have better uh, profiles in terms of distress uh, than people who uh, uh, undergo testing. Uh, part of this may be actually self-protective self, self -protective, uh, decisions uh, on their part. So um, 
that might be what's going on in, in those situations. There were some studies that saw either uh, uh, so, so, uh, so some studies didn't see anything, some saw positives, and some saw, saw, saw negatives. Um, another thing is that some people are ineligible for testing. So uh, what they did see in those cases is that there did seem to be increases of, of, of anxiety for those folks. Um, and then they also found that there was a range of different factors that influence, uh, may influence the distress that happens in, the, in these situations. All right, so what did I find? Um, I am, let's see, okay. All right, we're, we're doing okay on time. Uh, <laughs> so I, um, I found uh, in those 33 reviews I found, I, I tried to sort of parse them out into different types of categories of information. And um, I, I found the, the biggest sort of chunk of papers that were out there, systematic reviews, looked at cancer-related uh, genetic testing. And this is uh, generally for hereditary conditions, hereditary breast and ovarian cancer, uh, HMPC, C, uh, and um, looked at the psychosocial impact in that, in that context. So a lot of the literature that's out there has been done in, the, in those areas. I also found four reviews that looked at non-cancer related uh, health uh, outcomes. Um, and then I had uh, about six study systematic reviews looking at uh, pediatric testing, uh, three views that looked at direct to consumer uh, genetic testing. Again, that's testing that's marketed towards the public, typically looking at things like uh, moderate susceptibilities to, to, for risks. And then I have this sort of general other category. And the general might be, uh, there are some systematic reviews that sort of look across all different health conditions and pull information across them. And then there's uh, outcomes or uh, topics of interest related to psychosocial variables that don't um, sort of fall into that general category. For example, looking at communication of not necessarily looking at um, you know, whether people are harmed or benefit from this information. All right. So um, the first study that I'm going to talk about sort of I think is somewhat representative of this. Ca oh, so what I should first say here is I'm not going to go through all 33. Uh, I'm, what I've tried to do is to pull out 10 papers that kind of give you an idea of the scope of what's out there. And I think are, from my best estimate, are fairly representative of what we're seeing across that literature. Um, so uh, first off, I'm going to talk about the Heschka article from 2009. It's a little bit older. There are more recent reviews, but I like this because it looked across uh, a range of different cancers. Um, and uh, what they found looking at uh, different cancers was that um, and they also had two studies from, of Alzheimer's disease, but mostly cancers, uh, was that there were, uh, most of the studies were perspective, so uh, a little bit higher quality than some of the areas, other areas that we're looking at. Um, they didn't do a formal quality assessment, uh, but um, they did find that a lot of these studies were fairly small, and they also had self-selected samples, uh, which is fairly important when you're looking at psychosocial impacts, right? Uh, they were also samples that were fairly homogeneous. They were particularly white and high, typically had higher education. Okay. So uh, generally speaking, across these studies, they found that uh, they did not really typically see uh, substantial differences between uh, carriers and non-carriers uh, based upon the, the results that they found. Um, s some studies uh, that did observe uh, impacts, uh, transient impacts after learning this that were fairly short term, but typically refer, re return to baseline uh, after, uh, after a period of months. Uh, most studies didn't find a change in anxiety uh, over time. And again, when, they, when it was observed, they typically went a bit back to baseline. Again, most studies looked at depression stores, did actually saw no, no impact on depression. Uh, there were some cases where they did see a, a um, uh, impacts, uh, but they again were seen to be transient. Um, there was uh, limited evidence on worry in these studies, um, and it was a bit, a bit more mixed, but there did seem to be an increase overall across the, f they only found four studies in that context. So it seemed like there was an increase in worry uh, based upon getting testing. All right, so now I'll talk about Huntington's disease. I think Huntington's disease is an interesting example because it's uh, one of the first uh, predictive tests out there, and it was one of the ones that really inspired a lot of the concern around psychosocial impacts of testing. I remember in the 90s, a lot of the conversation was around people might go out and commit suicide based upon finding this information. So a lot of concern that there would be a very strong 
uh, impacts on, on psychosocial well-being. Um, oh, is that a countdown, or is that that's a countdown, or is that? Uh, all right, great, okay. <laughs> All right, <laughs> um, excellent. So, um, <laughs> all right. <laughs> I, it was, I, I saw it at 30 before and I was like, oh, I uh, better go through this fast. All right, so um, in terms of what the uh, most recent study we were in 2015 found, uh, looking at uh, eight different papers, was that they found that there was a variability in quality of the studies. Um, there was possible for sampling bias, again, uh, selective samples. Um, uh, there was a lack of information about people who didn't get testing. Uh, I, uh, uptake for hunting disease, if I recall correctly, is somewhere around 10% of people who are at risk, um, if I'm correct there. Uh, so a lot of people actually don't uh, get testing. So questions about who they are. Um, potential for bias from attrition. Uh, uh, measures typically ex uh, addressed general sort of measures of well-being as opposed to uh, the particular factors related to genetic testing it itself or the genetic testing for that disease. Um, and there are some issues with, uh, uh, again, small sample sizes and being underpowered. Okay. Uh, and some issues around uh, testing, multiple types of testing being used that might have exasperated uh, impacts. That being said, what they generally saw um, was that there was not a, they described it not, as not being any significant differences between uh, comparing measures for psychosocial impact based upon test outcome, positive or negative. Uh, I was a little unclear there because actually in the paper there were some examples of significant differences. Um, and I think maybe what they meant there is you know, clinically significant differences, but that was their overall summary statement. Um, they uh, found that uh, non-carriers uh, did not be, appear to be uh, harmed, uh, and that there there seemed to be non-significant not no non-significant trends towards possible be psychological benefits. Uh, there were some significant differences that were found. Um, uh, in particular, I thought it was interesting that they found that people uh, who were symptomatic. Uh, did seem to have a bigger impact in terms of distress than people who were asymptomatic. So that's something to consider going forward as well. Um, there were some uh, indications of uh, transit impacts in terms of hopelessness, um, but it didn't seem to uh, maintain over time. Uh, uh, there was also, uh, when they looked at uh, distress levels, that seemed to vary over time for both carriers and non-carriers in terms of measures for across these studies. Uh, I also wanted to include just a couple papers looking at other uh, conditions that were less, um, uh, um, less likely to uh, result in uh, uh, fatal outcomes. And uh, so I uh, included a couple papers around thrombosis testing. Here, uh, again, they saw uh, mixed, uh, very mixed data in terms of quality of the papers that were produced. Um, uh, a lot of retrospective studies, for example, uh, which have uh, uh, methodological challenges. Um, so they, uh, they were resistant to make recommendations, but they suggest that existing data did not suggest negative adverse uh, impacts. We also see that when we look at hemochromatosis testing. Here, it's a very small sample of only three papers. Um, but uh, they're limited quality and quantity, quantity, but not seeing much of a negative impact. All right. So um, I'm going to move on to talk about some of the other areas. That's just sort of a, a snapshot of what we saw across different types of conditions. Uh, so here I want to move into pediatric testing. So pediatric testing is a highly controversial area, uh, thinking about, uh, as was mentioned earlier, that there's been a lot of concerns raised about children finding out uh, about genetic information that's offered to them that they may or may not have either better or worse coping responses to genetic risks. Um, so uh, the, uh, the most recent study from 2016 looked at 13 different studies. Uh, they found that generally they had uh, they met their criteria for appraisal. Um, they their main concern was that none of the studies included representatives from uh, uh, of children or representatives to participate in study design. Um, they they said again um, th th again what they found is there d didn't seem to be a lot of evidence of significant impacts on anxiety, depression, or quality of life. 
There was some uh, concerns that were noted uh, that children from families with uh, inherited genetic conditions may have had uh, larger impacts. And then there were, uh, um, uh, there were uh, what they did in this uh, system I review that I thought was kind of interesting is they looked at all the different guidelines uh, around pediatric genetic testing and parsed them out based upon the concerns that were raised in those guidelines and then aligned them with all the evidence that was showing and they essentially saw that there's very little concordance between the evidence that we saw and the, uh, the concerns that were raised in the guidelines. Both of benefits and potential harms, so not much in either direction. Um, there was also uh, a few systematic reviews looking at direct, direct consumer genetic testing, which is kind of a different beast, and I think is somewhat interesting when we think about these, uh, the idea of moving more in a genomic direction. Um, they found uh, overall, in this study, 2015, nine different papers. Um, they assessed to have an overall uh, adequate uh, methodological quality, but variability there. Uh, bias from selection bias. Um, there was also a lot of use of convenient samples, which we know have real challenges. Uh, and uh, some of the studies were quite large, but a lot of them were also had small samples and also low response rates to surveys that were conducted. Um, so uh, overall, their, their summative statement was that evidence did not show benefits or harms to users. Uh, they saw little in the way of anxiety or significant differences pre or post test. Um, there was uh, some indications that uh, sharing information with providers had benefits uh, for both understanding worry among participants. Um, most, um, uh, when, when concerns were expressed by participants, it seemed to be primarily centered around privacy, genetic privacy. And uh, there was some evidence that suggested that people may be misunderstanding the results that they've received in terms of the overall impact of that DTC genetic information. All right, so um, now I'm going into the other category. And the other category is sort of where I get a range of different types of systematic reviews that illustrate different components to this fairly complex question. And here's a, a, a systematic review that I thought was interesting because what I tried to do is look at um, how people who are currently experiencing symptoms of a disease might differ in their psychosocial response from people who are asymptomatic. So um, in this, uh, in this uh, study, they found uh, 16 different papers. They found a variety of different uh, designs and methods. Um, they said overall that they felt it, that it was difficult to compare across these methodologies. But again, they make overall what they saw is that there was uh, no long-term differences in terms of uh, psychosocial well-being, anxiety, depression. Uh, they did see some, sh uh, uh, however, short term, they did see some impacts in terms of transient increases in de depression, anxiety, and distress after tests that went back to normal. Um, so that being said, what they did see is that even at baseline, even before t getting testing, that people who are sy symptomatic did seem to have some overall uh, lower general personal health assessments, higher levels of depression, uh, and sp higher disease-specific distress, uh, which suggests that they may be a vul more vulnerable population, right? Again, people who are symptomatic, very often they get testing without the benefits, same benefits of genetic counseling, or uh, they may not have the same preparation that people who are pre-symptomatic pre may have, so they may get this information in a way that they're less prepared and have less choice over whether or not they get this information. So that is an area where we might think about more in the future. There's another study by Colardall, uh, 2017, uh, that looked at personal utility. And I, I looked at this study, um, when we think about personal utility, that's uh, very often envisioned as uh, how people think about the usefulness of this information, um, which um, may or may not be seen as being uh, uh, fitting into that psychosocial variables, but I found it interesting that when they looked at this question, that they found that uh, utility that people often saw was uh, that it had benefits effective, that they perceived effective components to this. So that there was, uh, uh, they view, view utility in terms of emotion, emotion focused coping, that there was uh, per perhaps, perhaps utility in terms of mental preparation for future health. Um, 
uh, that in some cases there was increases or decreases in perceived responsibility for dealing with that information, and that there was possibility in terms of improved spiritual well-being, perhaps, for example, ideas around being able to live, live in the moment. Um, there were also some social outcomes that are worth uh, noting here in terms of uh, uh, utility that were, were noted, including um, uh, uh, views around altruism being, being engaged in this genetic project, uh, concerns about stigma and discrimination, concerns about privacy and co uh, confidentiality, and uh, some, concern, some thoughts around uh, social supports and impacts in terms of friends and family and also resources that are available to folks. Um, so I, I use this, uh, this systematic review to sort of talk about the idea that there might be impacts that are sort of uh, extend or are possibly more subtle than simple impacts around depression, for example, as a, as a measure. Well, not to say that that's simple. I also, uh, I include uh, a study looking at carrier testing. Um, I think that this is actually a, a really crucial systematic review, and I think it's important because I think it did a better job than any other systematic reviews of integrating qualitative data, okay? So what I found across these systematic reviews was that uh, a lot of them, I would say probably two thirds of them, included qualitative studies in their systematic reviews. But when you look at what, they are, what their conclusions are and what they actually talk about in their systematic reviews, it tends to underrepresent qualitative findings, okay? So in this systematic review, again, here we're looking at recessive x linked chromosomal carrier testing. So again, here we're talking about carrier testing where the individuals themselves should not be at increased risk for health impacts. So if anything, one would expect that psychological impacts of this would perhaps be lower than Hunting's disease or cardiovascular uh, ovarian cancer, um, but uh, this because this review I think more extensively uh, looked at qualitative data. It actually did a much I thought it provided a much more rounded view of potential uh, negative psychosocial impacts or or the range of different psychosocial impacts that you might see in, in this context. So they found a lot of different themes and I won't have time to go through this in detail, but they looked at things around anxiety. They did see some evidence of anxieties, looked at uh, elements of guilt. Um, they had some interesting things around uh, perceptions of relief after getting genetic information. Um, there was uh, some uh, um, some indications that carriers actually viewed their own health as being worse after finding out that they had carrier status, even though realistically, they, for mo in most of the situations, they shouldn't have had a major impact on health. Um, there were some indications of social stigma and self-stigmatization uh, st in, in these studies. Um, they are, there was also indications of coping, so that this information actually was helpful for engaging in that coping process. Um, there were some indications, uh, there, there didn't seem to be much of an impact on uh, reproductive plans, but people did think about and integrate that into their thoughts about re reproduction. Um, and uh, there was also uh, some factors that influenced this, like whether or not you had an affected child or whether or not genetic counseling was engaged. So point being here is that uh, I like this review because I think it's indicative of the way in which systematic reviews themselves may not actually be accurately representing all this information. And for people who are looking for fodder to say, look, this is not, uh, not entirely an accurate presentation of what we're seeing, this is something you might want to start with. Um, and there's a few other papers that also have similar types of things. Um, just a question, is that how much time is including uh, questions and answers or how much time I have to talk? Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> just want to be clear here. Um, I'll, try and, I'll try and move fast. Um, so uh, the final review that I just want to mention is family communication. And the reason I want to mention this in part is that uh, something that I saw across the systematic reviews is that there really wasn't an equal representation of studies that looked across the range of different psychosocial variables. Most of the research seemed to be focused around anxiety, worry, and depression. And there's relatively less focus, in my perception, on the communication strategies, on stigma, on those types of social components to uh, genetic information. Um, so this is the main one that I, that I identified in this process. And what they found was that there are real 
um, challenges that people experience when they learn about this genetic information around how do they think about it? How do they integrate that information? How to decide who to talk to, what, what to talk about? And that this is actually a cognitively challenging process for, for folks. Um, well, okay, I'll avoid the change it. don't have time. Uh, 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 there's also a um, range of uh, different strategies that were engaged in disclosing, and that there's a lot of different questions around who did they use to be intermediates in, in terms of helping them disclose this information. Uh, there was also um, uh, burdens that they, they talked about in terms of uh, having to undergo this process of communicating. And, um, um, and there was also some concerns that they had about this communication and this process for impacting their relationships, although there's some evidence that maybe communicating actually benefited, uh, improved those relationships. So um, some interesting findings there. All right, so here's my summary of what I saw. And uh, this is, can be a fodder for debate. Um, overall, almost every study I saw said that there wasn't, uh, there was limited quantity and quality of data, all right? Um, and some, most of them uh, uh, expressed a caveat uh, of that sort and then said, you know, here's overall what we saw. And I've appropriately seen statements uh, along the lines of, well, maybe they shouldn't have said this is what I saw if the quality is so low, um, <laughs> which is a reasonable criticism to make. Um, <laughs> so um, that being said, when they did see something, they typically saw um, when it comes to these potential negative psychosocial impacts, they typically saw that there was these uh, impacts were either absent or, or modest. Um, or um, if they did see impacts that they were transient, typically lasting, lasting a few months and returning to baseline. That's overall what I saw across the studies. I'll note when it comes to these uh, sort of overall statements, I'm not able to actually say a whole lot about these different social variables because there just wasn't a lot of systematic reviews that looked at it. So really what I'm talking about here is primarily that you know anxiety, worry sort of categories. There also was a lot of information about benefits, psychosocial benefits as well. So I can't say a whole lot about that, uh, but it did vary. There also wasn't a lot of indication of those huge benefits either in terms of social, psychosocial variables on the whole. Um, now, what I will say is if you look at these systematic reviews, there are things in there that you can find to say, yes, there are, it's not that genetic testing is not having an impact, all right? There are studies that do show that there is an impact, that people are responding to this information. So you will find that, you'll find that from the quantitative data, it's a little bit, it's more prominent in uh, hereditary cancers where you have high risks, very high risks of uh, 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 substantial and dangerous health, health impacts. Uh, but you do see them, those impacts. And um, you also see that uh, there are um, uh, significant, uh, when you look at um, findings from qualitative studies, you'll actually see that there are, um, that there is indications of a, a psychosocial response, all right? So how you interpret the overall synthesis of these findings is really a mirror. You could look at this and say, if you want to, you could look at this and say, look, these studies are poor quality, or, or you know, there, there's indications of poor quality, they're using measures that might not be appropriate, um, and uh, therefore I, you know, and there are indications that there are concerns, therefore we should keep on going forward. We could look at this and say, look, we've done a lot of studies, even if they're not of perfect quality, across, looking across the, all of these studies that we're looking at, if we're not seeing clinical or substantial impacts, really what are we turning our wheels on, right? So depending on how you, how you look at it, you could interpret this different ways. All right, um, recommendations. So what I did across these studies, I, here I just presented the findings. I also wanna say, I, I tried to synthesize what these studies tried to recommend in terms of future approaches. Um, because I think that that's what we're trying to do here in this, in this, in this project. So um, there were some overarching findings uh, in, uh, or recommendations to think about. The first one was found in every study, which is that we need more research, which is uh, <laughs> always what is gonna happen when you are have, ask someone to do a systematic review, because they always wanna know more. Um, but um, the, uh, they found that it was important to, uh, one recommendation was important to support autonomy, because there is, 
a variety of responses that people who self-select out of testing, that's actually important to allow them to do, to do because it may very well be that that's actually something. So making the assumption that just because we may see benefits or no negative psychosocial impacts of testing, therefore everybody should test, is probably not the right conclusion to come <laughs> at from these studies. Um, uh, there's also data needed across a range of different conditions uh, or for uncertain results. Um, and for uh, situations with unclear treatment uh, uh, options. There's also a real need for studies that look for in terms of diversity, in terms of uh, culture, race, gender, and education. So samples have not been representative on the whole. And uh, we also need more information about people who actually don't undergo testing. All right. So those are overall statements. In terms of general design, um, I think that uh, uh, there was indications that uh, a lot of these studies were not designed around theoretical models. Um, so uh, there's interest in having more theoretical approaches to doing these studies. There's need uh, for more, more longitudinal data. I will say that it seems that there has been some progress in terms of studies doing more longitudinal research. So I think the quality has improved over time, but there's still concerns there. More prospective randomized and post, uh, pre-post designs needed um, rather than retrospective designs. Um, uh, there's also the argument that we would have uh, benefits in terms of comparison if we have more uniform designs on the whole. So uh, it's hard to make comparisons across studies when you have wildly divergent, uh, divergent designs and also populations. So here's a conflicting area where if you have consistent populations, then you might have an impact on diversity. Um, settings, uh, it also uh, addressed the fact that a lot of these settings were not actually generalizable. So how much do we know about what this would look like in real context is also another the question that was raised. Um, the final point that I'll make in terms of these recommendations was around measurement. And this is a really big issue for this uh, question uh, because the first two points are in direct contradiction to one another. Um, <laughs> the first point is that uh, validated measures may not be capable, uh, validated measures of sort of general states like overall depression or overall well being or overall quality of life may not be able to detect the subtle changes that you might see in learning genetic risk information. Um, uh, as opposed to very specific custom designed surveys that address uh, address the exact responses to a specific genetic test. And I've seen that in studies that I've looked at where you can see that uh, studies that use these overall things find nothing. And when you look at the actual very specific measures, they do see, see impacts, okay? So, um, at the same time, you also see criticisms that we should be using validated measures that allow us to compare across studies. And a lot of these validated measures are these overall synthetic views across uh, of overall impact that in, can indicate clinical impact. And then there's also conversations around, OK, what are we looking at if we're not looking at clinical impact? And we can't show that in terms of the, the measurements. Um, uh, uh, other statements, uh, it was common to say that you know, we should look at benefits as well as harms in terms of measurements. Uh, there was concerns around the idea that when we, um, that maybe we should be doing research that focuses on people who experience harms uh, that are hidden by looking at average scores. So average scores, you might see that there is overall no significant impact on depression, but you might find that there might be five people who actually were depressed. So maybe we should be focusing on those five people and trying to understand what made them depressed and have that looking at those subsets for risk. Um, another idea was that, uh, that we need to attempt to uh, uh, distinguish the impacts of conditions from the impacts of genetic testing, which can be hard to distinguish. And uh, also, the, there's generally a need for more measurement and understanding of these broader social impacts. Um, I actually, uh, rather than try and state my opinion, um, my, I have opinions about this. I came into this with opinions. They changed somewhat in this process. Um, but I want to raise questions for us all. Um, and I'll just leave them up on here as we talk further because I'm out of time. And uh, you know, I think that there's some interesting questions about what does this information mean? And uh, uh, I'm curious what you all think because I know you all have exper experiences in this and, thought and the, uh, thought and thoughts on these questions. So uh, yeah. Have a seat in front of your questions. Like, oh, you can like stand. stand sure. <laughs> yeah. And I realized that in my preoccupation with the fact that he was between us and lunch, I forgot to introduce him. <laughs> so, uh, all you know about Christopher is that he does really impressive work. Uh, and uh, um, 
uh, puts together a great um, <laughs> survey. Of, uh, but he is an associate professor in the, in the Bothell School of Nursing and Health Sciences at the University of Washington. And he came to that through a zigzaggy course with a MPH, a public health degree first, and then a PhD in molecular biology. And now doing health behavior research on the impacts of genetic testing. Some of his own papers were probably captured by those systematic reviews. So, questions for? I don't know why other people are. I don't know why other people are being so slow to get up to the mic. Um, that was really amazing, Chris. Thank, Thank you. Just incredibly helpful. Thank you so much. One quick question. You mentioned sure. in passing, oh, Eric Perrins, the Hastings Center. Let's all start trying to, <laughs> to identify ourselves. Um, you mentioned in passing that your interpretation changed a little bit over the course of this work. Could you just say a little bit about that? Sure. Um, so, you know, when you go into a systematic review, obviously everyone has their biases. Um, and, uh, you know, I, my goal in doing this, though, was to actually try and minimize that as much as possible, right? You want to interact with the literature as best you can with an open mind. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that I, uh, I fall into the impatient category. Um, I, I do tend to think that I'm at this point, and I, I still am much more interested in questions around, rather than looking at impacts of harm, I'm much more interested in questions around things like, how do you support clinician-patient interactions around this? How do you support parents talking to their children about this information? That it might be how this gets communicated it might be far more important than the information itself. That uh, you know, when we look at things like uh, healthcare access, you know, when it, when we talk about bioethics, we need to think about you know uh, you know making sure that people have access to the information. There's a lot of, a huge range of different types of things that we could be thinking about in terms of impacts of genetic testing that extend beyond just does this have a psychosocial benefit or harm in terms of anxiety and other factors. So I've been kind of moving in the direction of saying, kind of not that interested in the question anymore because we're not seeing uh, major impacts that suggest that there's clinical impacts. And I'm pretty pragmatic. So if I'm not seeing clinical impacts, I'm sort of questioning what are we doing with this information? Um, and um, I, I would say that um, in going through that review, I did see more indications, particularly from qualitative studies, that made me more interested in that question. Um, and I, it made me think a little bit more about, OK, if we are going to move forward with this, what do we want to be looking at? You know, what do we want to what do we want to measure that actually would have benefits for helping us to help people uh, deal with this information? And uh, I'm actually confused about that. The answer to that. I actually don't really know exactly what we should be looking at or how we should be looking at it. Um, but there is there's an indication that something is going on. And I think that the conversation around if it's large enough to warrant the amount of research that's and the amount of focus and attention the LCH community has devoted to it, I think that's an open question. But I think that it's an interesting question. So did, did I answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, hi. Th thank you for an excellent presentation. I just wanted to introduce some more ideas into the discussion. Yeah. Uh, my name is Carolyn Siegel. I'm a medical yeah. sociologist uh, yeah. at, at um, Columbia, but pr prior to that was at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and early in my career fell in with some psychoanalysts and went back and completed psychoanalytic yeah. training. You know, I'm very interested that the whole issue of defense is, is really not included so much in this literature uh, that we don't sort of take account of the fact that what people can tell us about what they're feeling may not uh, factor in their defenses and how they can isolate the affect and repress affect. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, that's a very important thing to think about. The other thing is um, coping. Yeah, you know, my area is how people cope with health-related stressors. And we have sort of a black box. We have people, we test them, and then they come out with some kind of response. But we really don't know how they try to cope with that information. We know when you can't change the stressor, it's mostly emotion-focused coping. And I think we really have to put a little more emphasis on trying to understand what people tell themselves that enable them maybe to mute or suppress the impact. Also, of course, many of these studies 
select out people that have pre-existing anxiety and uh, depression, so you're dealing presumably with a group that's a little less vulnerable uh, to begin with. The, the other thing is, you know, there's a whole area of stress-related growth that I think maybe is relevant to this field of research. And the growth is not from the stressor, it's from how you cope with the stressor yeah. uh, and the changes that it, you know, instills in you. And I think that would be maybe another productive area to kind of look at in relation to this uh, field. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and there's definitely some of the things that you mentioned were reflected in the literature. Um, so we, you know, there's big questions around coping. For example, how do you cope when, uh, when you don't have the information and you know you're at risk? Uh, there's questions around whether that's a more uh, stressful state uh, and that getting that information can actually help you with that coping process. There's also uh, some interesting work around uh, trauma. The idea that these traumatic responses, uh, uh, if you're looking at these general measures of depression or, or, or states or anxiety, that actually the process of going through anxiety, going through depression can actually lead to productive changes in yourself that is actually useful uh, in terms of uh, figuring out a path that goes forward. So it's not necessarily, you, you shouldn't necessarily argue that these negative, arguably negative psychosocial states are not actually part of that coping, part of that resolution process that might actually not, might actually be beneficial. So it's, it's actually an interesting thing that we shouldn't necessarily view negative psychosocial states as being negative at all. Right, especially if we're if if we're dealing with health issues that we're going to have to deal with anyway. Um, yeah, great. Hi, Steve Popple. I'm a yeah. non-affiliated member of the IRB at Rockefeller University. A yeah. uh, question about the conflict between precision and significance, and the way that particularly seems to affect studies in social science, mm -hmm. and the expectations that one can have going into a meta-level analysis like you've attempted in in social science. Uh, since the gold standard, in a sense, is established by work in, in uh, multi-site drug trials where you're looking at, 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 at very limited effects and very specific um, questions. And, and um, so this is a question about, it's affected this conference so far, about expectations that we can realistically have um, as opposed to a subsequent um, uh, empirical discovery. Yeah. And whether the, the quest for comparability that underlies the examination that you undertook, um, really how realistic is that? Um, and specifically, I mean, one, one way this shows up, and I find this prevails in, in a lot of social science research, is the failure to do um, participant level cross tabs. You talked about the way things get buried in averages. Averages get compared as if there were uh, composite individuals. Right. So there may be intrinsic um, hurdles here um, that need to be addressed and may be difficult to overcome. Yeah. Absolutely. I think that's actually one of the main questions, the first one that I brought up, which is the idea of equifinality and multifinality. Like, why would we actually think that it's going to be e easy to measure these things? There's, it's, it, you know, you have, um, remember, psychological traits can have many different causes for, depression can be caused by a lot of different things that can lead to depression, right? There's many different factors that play into that, that outcome. And then the same type of genetic information for multiple people with different backgrounds can lead to a wide range of different psychological outcomes, right? So to be able to actually parse down in a concrete way it, it, using significant testing an actual difference between groups based upon this, that's hopeful and optimistic to think that we would be able to actually measure those things using quantitative measures. Um, you know, I, uh, it's, a, it's a distinct challenge for this, this field uh, as a whole. So uh, yeah, the, the, the level of precision in terms of our ability to do this, yes, in theory, you can look and see that there might be heightened depression in, in certain situations, and we do sometimes see that, but it would actually be hard to see given the complexity of the situation. Did that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. So Jim Evans, UNC yeah. Chapel Hill. Um, 
so first of all, thank you so much. That was, you know, you were given such a narrow, small <laughs> topic, right? And, and I, I, I did my best. <laughs> you no, know, it, was, it was fantastic. I, I leaned over and said, you know, I probably did more work on this than any of us, right, in preparation. Um, I, I just wanted to, to kind of jump off from something you alluded to. Mm -hmm. um, the, the name of this conference is looking for the psychosocial impacts of genetic testing. Yeah. But it seems like it's always seemed to me like almost all of the research that's been done is on the psycho part of that mm -hmm. and and not the social implications. And I'll just throw out a couple. I feel like the LC community maybe is insufficiently ambitious. So they spend a lot of time looking for individual differences, which is really important, but really hard and, you know, subtle. Mm -hmm. And, and maybe we need to look at bigger issues more frequently. And I'll throw out two, just my own, two of my own pet yeah. peeves. Um, one is in the realm of direct-to-consumer testing, and I won't even just qualify that as genetic testing, um, there was a wonderful commentary in JAMA by, I think, Elizabeth Rockwell, I don't know, about a year ago. I don't know who she is. I don't think she's in our community, but, but she pointed out um, what I see as a really valid point, that direct-to-consumer testing has grave social harms potentially, in that what it does is it offloads the, the easy parts of testing, that is doing the test, right, whether it's a scan or a, you know, genome sequence, um, and then dumps on the medical system um, a, a really difficult analytical job that we clearly aren't up for, okay, mm -hmm. that, that we, we don't know how to do. Um, that's a social harm, right? And I think it's fair game for the LC community to, to tackle social harms. My other, you know, one that I would throw out there is there's a bandwagon in the genomics, clinical genomics community, um, as well as people who like, you know, sell sequencing machines to, to sequence everybody, right, um, as part of their, quote, medical care, and which, which entirely ignores any axioms of good medicine and um, um, the, the axioms of parsimony in, in medical care. That's a social harm, right? When we see when we see those kinds of things um, um, being pushed, and we don't try to come up with evidence and arguments and all to question the assumption that it's a good thing, um, then I don't think we're doing the job we should do. So I, I just, you know, you alluded to that, but I wanted to, to amplify. It. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that we can be really creative as a community around what are the things that we should be looking at here? And I think, uh, again, I only presented the recommendations of the papers I actually looked at. I didn't look at, talk about my own recommendations, uh, but I, it's not something that I personally feel is that we need to think more carefully about genomics as opposed to genetic testing. And um, that when you start looking at a lot of different factors, this difference of magnitude might be a difference of, of kind. We might be see, it might be significantly different in terms of the way that people interpret and understand that difference of inf inf magnitude of information um, that Actually, we need to think about. To right, you know, it's tremendously complicated. And uh, I, at least in terms of what I've seen, I haven't seen evidence that there's difference, you know, moderately, but, but I, I, I suspect, I, I still think that's a very interesting question to ask. Sorry. Barb Secker, RTI International. Um, it was great, Chris. Really, Thank really you. appreciate all the work yeah. that you did. Um, and I'll, I have all the data for you for your prenatal systematic okay, review. Okay, great. Um, I just wanted to sort of marry your thoughts here, which are very consistent with, with some things that are going on in the Caesar community. I don't know if I can do this in my sleep-deprived state to know what Caesar stands for. Comparative... Clinical sequencing Cl exploratory. Thank you. Clinical sequencing exploratory research one and two. Um, there was an effort made to um, merge data in, the, in very discrete um, studies in the first cohort, which was done and it was found to be very, very hard. For instance, um, almost all of us used some kind of alter, altered state of the micra, which it comes from the cancer mm -hmm. arena, which is around test-related distress and uncertainty. 
but there were eight different versions just in our small studies, so it made comparison really hard. So now in the new set of studies, there's an effort for harmonization, which is really fascinating process because the studies are very different so getting people to agree on the measures has ended up being very difficult but one of the things that's been pretty consistent and clear is that we, the better outcomes for finding variability are test related outcomes so Dave Veenster and colleagues have developed instead of versions of the micro what he's calling a factor and it includes these nuances of um, genomic or genetic test results um, that isn't specific to cancer and he's already validated it um, so we're using that and there's now refined measures of uncertainty related to genetic information and things like that so I think we are starting to drill down a little bit but I'll bring up in my talk something that you mentioned which is we don't we infrequently have our stakeholders here at the table, right? So we need to be asking them what they see as the outcomes that they're shooting for. Um, and we do need to be take a lot of care around these general measures. I think anxiety is a, such a terrible indicator of anything because if I'm going to tell somebody that they're at increased risk, I better hope that they're getting anxious. I mean, that's an indication that they're engaged in a conversation and a yeah. deliberation about what's going on, right? Yeah. Why would we think that's a negative outcome, yeah. right? And depression is really actually symptoms of depression. And most of the cancer studies, we did a little bit of a um, systematic review on this, show that people who have depressive symptoms um, had them at, at baseline. I mean, the same people who are most likely to have depressive symptoms were the ones that came in with them. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll just touch on the idea of sort of having consistent measures. Uh, that, that's pretty reliably found in almost all these reviews where they say we need more consistent measures. Um, and I, I, I like your example because it is there. One could imagine that maybe we can actually have consistent measures, right? That we can have some sort of. It's not the way we typically do research. You know, the way we typically do research is we all just have our own ideas and do our own thing. Um, but what would it mean, or what would it look like to have some? greater consistency. Now, the challenge of consistency, again, is that if we're moving towards those genetic test-specific measures, then it can't be necessarily be con consistent across uh, tests that are different, right? So um, what I would generally say, I mean, my general thoughts on this are, you know, if you have to choose between being consistent across studies and doing something that's genetic test-specific, I would probably pick genetic test specific because then, then at least you're seeing something. At least you, you measure something. If you look at something that's so general that you can't see anything, then you're wasting your time because you can't even see anything to talk about. Uh, at least with the gen genetic test specific information, you might get something that you could talk about in some way with quantitative measures at least. Yeah. Hi, I'm Quinn Walker, Stanford. I yeah. uh, really enjoyed this. thought it was okay. super illuminating. Um, so, so one thing that I think that systematic review might be very well suited for is a kind of a meta analysis of the penetrance and risk factor in terms of increasing anxiety and depression. Is that something that you saw in maybe the cancer systematic reviews or was that kind of a failure of the qualitative data lack that you mentioned? Um, so we did, I, you do see that there's a difference in terms of the magnitude of risk in terms of the psychosocial responses. So typically when we did see things like depression or other things popping up, they tended to be among highly penetrant, highly uh, conditions with more, greater risk. So we did see that. Um, I'm not sure that we know or that there's been studies that have really looked at in, ter in terms of a gradient and sort of charted that in a more complex way. And I certainly haven't seen a meta-analysis that tried to do that. Um, I would have to think about that, yeah. Hi, I'm Rachel Grab from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I want to add my thanks. I'm sure. so excited that you've done this and that we're yeah. going to be um, publishing essays together because I think you've teed up so much that's of interest for everyone. I am wondering if you can comment a little bit more on how the systematic reviews deal with this question of duration. That is, when do measurable effects sort of go away and therefore get discounted um, and on a sort of philosophical note, I, I'm curious about this because it seems to me that in much of the sort of psychometric 
um, measurement world, if something doesn't last, it's not considered to be so important. But um, in a sociological frame um, and just sort of a human one, that just doesn't seem to be true. Um, I mean, the fact that I don't necessarily have lasting trauma, for example, doesn't mean that something significant didn't happen to me that changed my life and is a remarkable phenomena, as in should be remarked upon. So I'm just wondering what your thoughts are or what, what you saw in the literature on that question. So. Let me think. Uh, so you can keep on responding to me if, if uh, I don't get what you're asking. But uh, this was an issue that came up. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of the comments were around um, needing more longitudinal data. Also, the idea of not just longitudinal data that looks across months, but that looks perhaps across many years, right? Um, and there wasn't a lot of research that looked across many years. It typically, you know, typically maxed around tw 12 months or so. Um, in terms of the, uh, I think, the response to looking at this transient of effect, I think that my, what I would say about the way that that's talked about is I think a lot of people were commenting on that are sort of comparing that depression or that psychosocial response to the health benefits of this. And they're essentially pairing them up against each other and saying, you know, there's potential health benefits to this, therefore, you know, we don't have to, you know, this might be a worthwhile negative psychosocial response to get through in order to gain those health benefits. So I think that that's the, the framing of that response is that getting at what you're talking about? I think yeah. that's I think that's what's going on there in terms of how it's talked about. You know, I I, I didn't feel like I didn't feel like the the people writing these reviews were intentionally dismissive of of these these impacts, but I do feel like they did uh, really latch onto these quantitative findings as being very and in a way that. They, and they didn't sort of integrate or give full due attention to the qualitative findings. And some of them actually entirely excluded qualitative findings from their, from their analysis. So um, yeah, I don't know. Did, did I answer your question? As much as would be fair to ask for, okay. since I know Eric's hungry and right. it is lunchtime. <laughs> yeah. Cool. OK, great. great. Well, Thank you all. Uh, Rachel and Eric, do you have any special instructions for